equation for the capacitor? Remember that for a capacitor, you had something like this, right? This was C, and if this is plus, 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 minus, 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 you know, plus Q here, minus Q there, there's a potential difference between them, right? What's the relationship between the capacitance, the voltage between the plates, and the charge, the magnitude of the charge. What's the master equation here? Anyone remember? Q equals? C delta V, right? So I like to think of C as the constant of proportionality that has to do with the area of the plates, how big they are, the separation between the plates, right? Now, for the resistor, what we have is something like this. Now, what you have is a potential difference between the two ends of the resistor. There's a potential difference that will lead to a current, right? And the resistance of the unit is R. So what is the relationship between the resistance of the unit, the current through it, and the potential difference, the voltage across the ends of the resistor? It's just on wrong. If you like to think of it like that, that's okay. I like to think of R as the constant of proportionality. What does it have to do with? I erased it, but a little while I wrote that the resistance is the electrical resistivity, which is sort of like, that's like epsilon naught for the case of the capacitor times the length of it and divided by the cross-section area. It has to do with how long it is, how wide, you know, how thick it is. It's to do with the geometry and something about how good of a how much resistance it poses to the flow of charges. Now, what if I take the same battery, same battery, that one. <laughs> so battery, same, and the voltage is 12 volts, right? Because it's the same battery. And I connect it to this other resistor with a resistance of four ohms. Now, what's going to be the direction of the current and the value of the current? Let me call it I prime. I don't know, probably call that R prime. So it's different from that. Which way is the current? To the right. To the right. And how big would it be? Because 3 times 4 is 12. Here, 6 times 2 is 12. So notice, which of these two circuits has more resistance? The one on the right or the one on the left? The one on the right. And because it has more resistance, does it have more or less current for the same voltage? Less current, right? So when you purchase a battery at the store, you don't go to the store and say, you know, give me a, you know, a 1.5 uh, amp battery. Or give me a 5 amp battery. The rating is only in volts, right? They can only ensure what this voltage is. What the current is going to be will depend on what you connect to the battery. If you connect something, the current is going to be whatever, such that the resistance times that current will give you the battery, you know, rating on the voltage. But if you connect something else, you're going to get a different current in the circuit for the same voltage, right? Because, it'll, you know, you're going to get more current if you have less resistance. And you're going to get less current if you have more resistance in the new thing that you connected to, your, to the battery. So the rating is usually not in terms of the current in the battery, but the voltage across the terminals, right? This is what you purchase. What you're gonna get over here will depend on what you connect, and the people selling you the battery do not know what you're connecting to it, right? So, okay, I'll just tell you, here's a voltage, right? And then, another thing that's cute about this equation is this. Um, lamp posts in the street, in the sidewalk. That's the street. Okay, we'll put a car over there. Somebody's driving this way. And you got a lamppost. 
Or actually not a lamppost. Um, okay, well, there's a lamp over there. But that's not what I was thinking. You have a post over here, and maybe another post over there. That's so that it's in front of the car, right? But then you have the wires over here, right? The high tension wires. Right? And then you got another one here. Especially like older cities, like you know, here in Costa Mesa. You'll see those wires in the streets, right? By the side. The newer cities, they feed those wires on the ground. Um, and then, you know, the, 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 they insulate them in case, in case, right? You know, there, there's a, a, a branch from a tree that falls and hits it and breaks it and goes to the ground. And you don't want to grab that thing, right? Especially at the end, don't go like, ooh, let's look at this wire. <laughs> don't do that. Because that's, uh, that has a lot of voltage. Um, and the ground is zero. So if you have a big voltage, you're the resistor. You're gonna get a lot of current through you and that it's enough to kill you, right? And you know, especially outside the cities because the electricity, the voltage that you know, uh, is produced and the um, you know, electrical generator units uh, and then uh, it's stepped up to high voltages and then it's tra transported to the cities. They step it up using transformers to high voltages because there's less of a loss in energy in transporting that to the cities where it then gets transformed back to lower voltages. So, you know, um, the electrical power plant in San Onofre, which was a nuclear power plant, right? Um, you know, they, then you have this next to that unit, it's not operating anymore, but uh, but they have these big transformers that then raise the voltage to you know, 100,000 volts, 150,000 volts, and then it gets delivered to the cities. And then you need transformers in the cities to you know, step that down to all you want over here is 120 volts. You don't want 100,000 volts over here. So usually, in fact, there are some posts where you'll see like some big unit over there, like some that big canister like this. And that's a transformer, right? To transform, and then in the building, here in this building, if you walk out over here, there's like a unit over there right next to it. It's just a transformer in there to, to further bring down the, the voltage. Anyway, this thing could be, you know, especially out, outside the cities, this could be a lot of volts. You know, 50,000, 80,000 volts. Why can a bird come in I used to be good at drawing birds, but not anymore. Okay, that's a bird. It's a big bird, but you know, it's a bird. Well, you know, if this wire is, let's say, uh, let's say it's a, you know, a, you know, ten thousand volts. How come the bird doesn't get killed? Speed you know, the bird has a resistance. Its body has a resistance, right? Speed of a high resistance. What? Speed of a high resistance. It's because it's not grounded, so the electricity just continues through the wire rather than going through the bird. Why not? Because it's just going to go where there's less resistance and where there's more. So it'll well, just keep going through. Anyone else? The resistance of the bird is higher than the wire. No, it's a cute little thing. <laughs> no, it, it won't take it. The wire's just yeah, that, that helps a lot. But let's say it's been eroded a lot and it's bare. There's no potential for difference. Exactly. What is, there's no potential. If there's no potential difference, I don't care what the resistance is, there's not going to be a current. If there's no potential difference, there's not going to be an electric field through it. So what is the potential on this leg? 10,000 volts. What is the potential on the other leg? 10,000 volts. So through the bird, there's no potential difference. So then there's no current. So if I land on a... No, but if that wire. bird says like, oh, I want to go touch that wood. It looks really cute. And it goes like that and then touches it. Then you got 10,000 volts and zero because that's connected to the ground. Zap, it gets zapped. So 
It's the voltage. It's the potential difference. You need that to set up the electric field, right? It's again, going back to this equation, right? right? If the potential difference is zero because it's the same throughout, the electric field is gonna be zero between those points. And if there's an electric field, there's not gonna be a current driven through it. Never a dumb question. <laughs> so I uh, like you hang on the the, the wire would fall. Don't touch the ground. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If you, you ever like... watch Tango and Cash, I don't know. You were, you were not born when Tango and Cash. It's an old movie with Kurt Russell and Sylvester Stallone, and um, they play cops in LA, and uh, they get accused of being corrupt, and they get put in jail, and then they escape from the jail, and then, uh, you know, they have to jump from a very, from the rooftop of the jail, which is, you know, quite high above the ground, and then they say, okay, then they take off their, one of them says, okay, let's take off our belt, and then they jump, and then they 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 touch this, right, and then they glide down, shh, slide down, but then one of them tells the other one, don't touch the ground, you gotta let go before you hit the ground, right, so then they go like, shh, and then, don't touch the ground or a tree while still touching that high voltage cable, right? So then you gotta let go and then so they, they have to jump and hit the ground and so on. Time to cash, good physics there. Wait, <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't the belt have zero? The, the, belt, the belt is, a, you know, it's touching the person, yeah. right? So it's, if, it's, if this is 10,000 volts, 10,000 volts, 10,000 volts, and then you just, you know, then there's no potential difference, so you're not gonna get a current through you. Uh, and then, you know, then you let go, right? And then you, well, you don't have the potential difference anymore. And then you, you hit the ground and you just gotta worry about not breaking a leg. But if you keep going down, 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 and you touch the tree to hang on while you're holding on to, you know, 10,000 volts and zero volts, then you get a big potential difference. Now you're the resistor and shh, that current is gonna go through your heart and that's it. A current of 75 milliamps for a few seconds will kill you. Is I mean, going through you like actually electrons going through your mm -hmm. body? Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and by the way, the other thing is this, I, I, I failed to make this, this, this comment. Um, in this circuit, right? Uh, suppose this is a light bulb. Right? Uh, how fast did we say the free electrons move roughly? They drift, we said like around a millimeter per second. The, given the voltages, right? So, a meter is probably about the length of this. This is a little less than a meter. Maybe a meter is up to here. But a meter is how many millimeters? A thousand. A thousand. So how long would it take a free electron to go from here to here if this is a wire in a circuit? To go from here to here. If it's gonna go one millimeter in one second, one millimeter, one second, one millimeter, one second, one millimeter, one second. A thousand seconds. A thousand seconds, how long is that? Ooh, one minute has 60 seconds, right? So 10 minutes would be 600 seconds. So it'd be more than 10 minutes, but less than 15, less than 20 seconds. Uh, minutes, minutes, minutes. So you're talking 16 minutes or so. So in a wire with typical values of, of current, right? It takes like 15, 16, 17 minutes for the electric to go from here to there. Right? So how come I turn off the lights or turn them on and we don't have to wait 15 minutes for the you know the influence to get to the lamps and then you know turn on, right? Is it because there's an electron everywhere along the wire? Exactly. And the electric field, as soon as you close the circuit is set up at the speed of light in the circuit. So immediately, as soon as you close the circuit, there is an electric field here, there is an electric field here, there is an electric field there, there is an electric field there, there is an electric field there, and there are electrons already there. And they, boom, immediately respond. They, it's like they all move. I wish that's how traffic <laughs> operated. You're in a lane, right? You're third, fourth, fifth, waiting for the traffic light. And the traffic light turns from red to green, 
And I wish we all moved at the same time. It's like, go, 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 you know, because I need to grow. And when I get there, it's going to turn red again, right? Because the people in the front were not, you know, it's like one car goes and then another one. And then there's a delay, right? But that's not what happens in the circuit, right? It's like they all go immediately. And they all respond. This electric field is set up at the speed of light, literally at the speed of light. And immediately they respond. By the way, in these buildings, in your house, your house is built, and when it's built, it's got wires in it. You have the conducting materials in there. Right? When you pay your utility bill, right, you're not purchasing electrons from the utility company. It's not like the company says, okay, you pay me, and I'm going to send you electrons. <laughs> You're not paying for the electrons. You have the electrons in your wires already. It's conducting material for every atom. The copper, actually the best conductor, the best conductor is silver. But why do you, and, and the second best conductor is copper. Why do you think the wires are not made of silver? Because it's expensive. Money, right? Another issue with money, right? So copper is cheaper. So, you know, the wire is, you know, copper is used because it's cheaper and, you know, I guess because there's more of an abundance of it. Um, and so you have the electrons and the wires, right? I mean, if we turn off the lights over here, right? There's no lights over here. I mean, the, the, the wires are there. The free electrons are there. They just don't know where to go. When you close the switch, when you hit the switch over there, you're closing a switch over here. And then the, you know, the utility company is providing you that electric field. Right? It's providing you really like the energy to drive your electrons when they become part of a circuit. So you're purchasing really the, like, the voltage that the utility company can set up in your house so that your electrons, they're already yours, then flow in your wires. You're, it's like you're paying for the electric field that the utility company sets up in your wires. It's just that if you have a wire and there's no electric field through it, the electrons don't know where to go. There's no preferred direction. They don't see F equals QE. Yeah. Which way do we go? They just hang out, collide with one another, and you know, hey, what's up? You know, <laughs> no class next week, right? We got, you know, spring break. <laughs> so you're not paying, you're not purchasing electrons from the utility company. You are purchasing the energy, you know, the <laughs> voltage, the electric field that's then used to drive the electrons that you already know. It'd be nice if you just sit down and say, Hey, dudes, come on, go, because I need some light over here. Electrons don't speak English, <laughs> nor Spanish, or <laughs> Vietnamese, or what other language are spoken here? Russian. Um, are you Iranian? Farsi? OK, so they don't speak Farsi. Um, what other languages do we have here? Korean? Oh, there was a presidential election, right? Obviously. In Korea? I don't know, last couple of weeks. I, I, I hope a good person won. Chinese? Ni hao ma, ho ha ji. No Chinese people in the house. Japanese? Japanese? Yeah. OK. Um. <laughs> You've been here like for six years? No. I, I, I have been learning Japanese for six years. I was oh. in high school. I was wow. about to die. Cool. That's a big task. Yeah. Why? Skip the subs. It's a small country, and I like and I also like, like their shows. So. What's that? <laughs> the Koreans have good movies too. Very good movies. Very good movies. I recently watched one that's called. Um, no, Parasite. Parasite. Move to Heaven? I don't know if you've ever seen. No? Move to, move, I think it's Move to Heaven. Any Koreans in the house? Who's, who's Korean here? You know that movie? No. 
Very different, very different, and very, very, very good. Anyway, are we, how much time do we have? Are we done? Yeah, oh, we have half an hour. Oh, yeah. Somehow I thought we were done at five. <laughs> Couldn't you think of it as like, back to the analogy, like if you const your pipes are constantly full of water and you're paying for the pressure, basically? Like you pay for the pressure? Exactly, pressure difference. Okay. So, uh, glad you brought up that point. Where did you like dump the water and everyone away? Where did you use yeah. it? Because like the electrons don't just disappear. So, if you're green, like, what do you call a difference <laughs> yeah, yeah, in something? <laughs> what do you call a difference in something with respect to time? Rate. The rate. But what do you call a difference of something with respect to distance? Velocity. No, that's that's if something is moving. The word is in calculus three you learn it gradient. A gradient is like something is changing as you move to new locations. Uh, if something is changing, you know, or you know, as time goes on, or period of time is Rate. So in physics 185, you all took physics 185, right? You have a pipe. Say this is a pipe. And you get water on here. Well, this is part of a pipe, right? And you know, there's water all over the place, right? It's, this is just part of a pipe, a segment, right? Uh, what needs to happen if you want water of density rho to flow this way? So you write Bernoulli's equation, right? Something like this, Bernoulli's equation. Right? So you have like P1 plus 1 half rho V1 squared plus rho GH1 equals P2 plus 1 half rho V2 squared plus rho GH2. Well, if this pipe is horizontal, let's keep it simple, then the heights cancel, right? And if you want the water to flow in one particular direction, right, you're going to have a pressure difference. If the pressure, you know, uh, if the pressure here is higher, and uh, the pressure here is lower, you know, this is better explained, I guess. <clears throat> like when you change the this like this. Right? So let's say the pressure here is P1, the pressure here is P2, right? Uh, and then you can talk about the speed of the water here, the speed of the water there, right? And this equation relates these two pressures to these two speeds. Right? And if the if the water is flowing to the right, this pressure is bigger. So you need, in order, in order for there to be a current of water, you need a pressure gradient, a difference in pressures. So you need a, uh, the difference in pressure, which is called the pressure gradient, difference in position, right, from here to there, drives the current of water. So you need a delta P for there to be a current between the ends. Uh, in chapter 17, 18, which you don't learn in physics 185, but you learn in physics 285, you talk about the following. What if you have a, a metal wire and you have a metal wire like this? It's a metal, right? Uh, and suppose you maintain this end hot and this end cold. Maybe you put some ice over here and some fire over there. 
So the temperature here is high, T high for T hot, and here is cold. Obviously, T hot is greater than T cold. So maybe I'll just use that. Now, what happens if you have a temperature gradient? Then thermal energy is going to flow. So now it's going to be thermal energy flowing this way from hot to cold. Right? So, so you have you know, a heat current. Heat energy current. So what do you need? A temperature gradient. That is a different temperature with different positions. And you write an expression for the energy that flows per unit time, or the energy that flows per unit time, which is the power, is proportional to the cross-sectional area. It is proportional to the temperature difference, which is the temperature gradient divided by the separation between those two positions. And there is a parameter over here, which is called the um, thermal conductivity. And so in order for there to be a flow of heat energy, a current of heat energy, right? You need a temperature gradient. In order for there to be a flow of a fluid, right, a liquid, you know, or, or some material like, you know, a liquid, like in this case water, you need a pressure gradient. There has to be a delta P with respect to X, right? There has to be a, a, a delta T with respect to X, a temperature gradient. And what we're talking about here is, now you have, well, another wire, And, uh, you know, metal. And now what we say is that you have the free electrons over here, right? And if you want these electrons to flow, you need a difference of something between those two ends. It's a potential difference with position, right? So this is L, for example. So you need a potential here, electric potential. And electric potential here. But you want you need them to be different. So maybe this is V low potential and this is V high, right? Um, so that will set up an electric field is what we're talking about here, right? From high to low, and that, and then there's going to be a current, a flow of electrons. Now you got a current of electrons. Right? And the electrons are actually going to go the other way, but we say that the current is this way. Only because from convention, right? So now, now you get a current or a flow of electrons. And in order for that to, be, to happen, what's going to drive those electrons is the electric field. But in order for there to be an electric field, there has to be a potential difference. There has to be a gradient in potential. So the electric field, right, is like minus dv dx in this case. You need a, you know, you need a, a gradient in potential. So uh, a flow of charge will take place if there is a difference in electric potential across the ends, i.e., a uh, potential gradient. Yes? So, in order for charges to flow, 
it's easier to think of there has to be an electric field. But if there's an electric field, there's got to be a difference in potential. So that difference in potential, that voltage is what drives the electrons you know, from one direction to the other, from one end of the wire to the other end. It is that difference in potential, that voltage, right, that then results in a current. And you know, that is what Ohm's law is pretty much saying. So you need a liquid to flow, you need a pressure gradient. You need heat energy to flow from hot to cold, you need a temperature gradient, hot here, cold over there. As you move in position, the temperature is different. And if you need electrons to flow, making up an electric current, you need an electric potential gradient, a difference in electric potential, just like a difference in temperatures, or a difference in pressure. Yes? Gravity, right? You need something to flow from here to the bottom, leave it alone, it'll just go like this. You need a height gradient. Right? You need a, a difference in height. Okay, so I'm really getting tired of this. <laughs> and it's the same with chemicals, right? If you have, if I come in here and I take out a perfume bottle and I spray some perfume molecules over here, right? So initially there are no perfume molecules in the rest of the room, but then I just sprayed off a whole bunch of perfume molecules over here. So now I have a high concentration of perfume molecules over here and zero concentration everywhere, everywhere else in the room. So now I have a concentration gradient. And that's going to drive a, a flow of those perfume molecules to the rest of the room. They'll diffuse, right? They'll diffuse to the rest of the room. So you need a concentration gradient right, to drive that flow of perfume molecules from high concentration to low concentration. Yes? So for the gravity one, when pe people can sometimes describe like mountains and gradients, like is that related to the yeah, work we can talk that about we're that. doing now? Like, and probably, probably what they refer also is like the difference in the gravitational field. Because as you go higher, higher, higher above, the gravitational field gets smaller, smaller, smaller. Not by a lot, but you know. That, 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 ohms. Uh, this just tells you how resistance is affected by temperature. Usually, and this is usually, not, not always, depending on the materials, right? Um, if you heat up a material, usually, like if you heat up a wire, um, a copper wire, then the, uh, as the temperature goes up, do you think the resistance gets smaller or bigger? It gets bigger. Now why? Because the molecules are shaking, so it's more likely for the electrons to collide. Exactly. So the higher the temperature, the more rigorously or the greater the amplitude of vibrations of the lattice ions, the atoms, the nuclei with the other 28 electrons, the, the more amplitude they have to vibrate. And so for an electron that's moving through it, the greater the chance that it will collide. I mean, imagine... Um, Imagine I have to run out the room, but you're all moving around. If I run towards the door, I'm more likely to hit someone on my way to the over there. But if you know, if you just stay put in some locations, I can say I'm going to go this way, and I'm going to hit anyone. I don't, maybe that's a bad analogy. But. Is that why you have to cool a computer? Like you, like you need to cool it so electricity continues to flow. Yeah. Well, the other thing is that. There, you also have fuses in there. So the way that a fuse works is you have a wire, and you have a wire, and then you know you have a, like a fuse over here, which is just like, you can have a metal casing with glass over here, so you can see through it. Metal to connect to the wire, and then you have a thin wire in here. Right? Maybe you have something over here that's expensive. Uh, you know, later in the, in, in the circuit, right? And if you get too much current this way, it'll ruin this, it'll fry it. And it's expensive, and you don't want to do that. So you put the fuse in series with it, so that if too much current goes in here, right, 
that big current is going to raise the temperature of that thin wire, and it'll melt it. And that's, that opens the circuit. So, you know, uh, yeah, some things are not meant to work at some temperature, so you, know, you should not let them heat up so much. Uh, but that's what that is. I mean, there's a whole lot of other stuff over here that you can read about, and you know, I kind of want I discussed over here like that time between collisions. There is a just plug and jump type of formulas. I mean, I really didn't want to. this stuff over here. It's better to talk about it in chapter uh, like this over here. It's better to talk about chapter 26 first, and then come back and discuss this. Instead of this, this is going to be simple here. You see that, and it's like, oh my goodness, you know what is that? So. Um, so we won't need the temperature stuff for any of the tests, correct? No, I'm not going to put that. That's just a plug, plug and chug type of thing. I mean, I, can, I guess I can make a, a couple of comments about it, about that formula. This is for some materials called normal metals. So you have that. So this is the resistivity. Since we have, I guess, another 10 minutes, let me say something about that. That expression just tells you the resistivity of the wire as a function of temperature. So this is the resistivity right, equals, that's the resistivity at this, of some value, right? And then you have one plus alpha, and then you have T minus T naught. I think that's what it is, right? Yeah. So this is the resistivity at this temperature. And this is the resistivity at this temperature. In other words, if you tell me the resistivity at 20 degrees Celsius, and you ask me, what is the resistivity at you know, 35 degrees Celsius? Then I can use that formula to figure out what the resistivity is at another temperature. And this is a parameter that depends on whether you have a copper wire or aluminum wire or a gold wire. You know, it's a parameter that is specific to the type of material that you have in there. And I mean, if you multiply this out, you get what? Rho naught plus rho naught alpha T minus rho naught alpha T naught, right? So this is like, you know, this is like rho naught alpha T plus, and then you have this constant over here. So you know this is the resistivity as a function of temperature, and you can see that it is linear. So so usually what you see is this. This is the temperature plotted on the horizontal axis. This is the resistivity, and uh, this expression is correct for temperatures around room temperature. So somewhere over here, and it's linear like that, right? Raise the temperature, the resistivity gets bigger, and it grows linearly. So it's like a line. Now. If this is in Kelvin over here, what is the lowest possible temperature of anything? Zero Kelvin. So this is the lowest possible temperature, right? So for most materials, right, it goes down like this. Copper is one of them. And then because of impurities and defects in the material, this doesn't quite go to zero, but it kind of goes like this. This is called a normal metal. Now, there are some materials that exhibit the following behavior. materials where if you measure the resistivity, so a function of temperature in Kelvin, and this is zero. So around room temperature, you get that classic behavior. But when you get down to low temperatures, instead of going like that, it goes like boom. It goes to zero. 
zero. So in this region, there is no resistance. If the temperature of the material is smaller than this critical value here, there's no resistivity. And you see how electrical energy is dissipated in a circuit. I'm gonna solve an example when we come back from break, and I'm gonna, I mean, from spring break, and I'm gonna solve that one and show you. But this was first observed in 1911 by Kamerling Onnes, Dutch, in Mercury. So, notice, the smaller the resistance, does it become a better or worse conductor as the resistance gets smaller? Better. Because uh, better or smaller or worse? Better. Better, right? So what happens with these materials, well, this is like copper, right? So it does, you know, if it's colder, it's a better conductor. In this class of materials, right, they behave like a normal metal. So this behavior over here is, you know, a normal metal. But like magic, at some temperature, which for the case of mercury, this was actually four Kelvin. It's a low temperature effect. Then the resistivity goes to zero. So it's like the ultimate best conductor. And this, over this range of temperatures, this thing is a superconductor. So a superconductor is a class of materials that below a certain temperature, all the way down to zero Kelvin, it's superconducting because the resistance is zero. To the, and, and then, because the resistance is zero, you have no electrical energy dissipation into thermal energy. And you can start a current, disconnect it, you know, and then the, thing, the current persists. And there have been experiments done with, where people you know, keep track of a current in a superconducting material, and it stays the same for like two, three, four years, years. So um, the problem is that, well, the problem is that this is a very low temperature effect. There are a lot of people trying to invent, create materials with a critical temperature that's you know, around room temperature. But you know, like the best superconductor so far is like um, 150, 170 Kelvin. We're st it's still uh, over 100 degrees, you know, minus 100 degrees Celsius is still a very cool phenomenon. Right? And when we study magnetism, uh, one of the applications of, of, of magnetism is in, is in MRIs, magnetic resonance imaging. Um, when you go for an MRI, right, they have a coil, a big ring like this, and uh, you got the big ring, and then there's a bed in the ring, and you lie down, and then zzz, they pull you in, so this is you, and you got the ring like that. And what they do is they establish a current in this wire. But this wire is bathed with like liquid nitrogen, which is like at 77 Kelvin. And at that low temperature, the wire becomes superconducting. And therefore, you can establish in that wire, right, in this ring of many loops and turns and so on, because it is superconducting, you can establish a huge current. And electric charges in motion generate magnetic fields, as well as electric fields. So the idea of an MRI is for you to sit in there and for them to create a huge magnetic field right through your body. And the, the resolution of the images of your biological tissues with you know, the details and so on is greater the greater the magnetic field you're sitting in. Which means they want a superconducting wire because that's what's going to be able to generate the biggest magnetic fields. So usually these MRI machines are maybe in some trailer right next to the building or in some area and they're pretty cold. I mean, they, they close the thing, they cover it with nice beautiful plastic, but it's gotta look horrible in there because it's too scary, I guess. Uh, but they gotta keep them cold below this critical temperature so that the wires become superconducting so that then they can establish a huge magnetic field and therefore um, get better pictures of your biological tissues. Oh, you've got a tear in your ACL over here or you know whatever it is that they're taking a, 
Um, they're taking a picture of. Is it so loud? Because it's so working so hard to keep it cold. What's that? Is it so loud because it's hard to keep it that cold? You know, like when you get an MRI, it's extremely like, loud. Yeah, they give you like earplugs. Um, I mean, some rings are pretty small, and if, if you're getting an MRI like in this area, it's like you know you got this thing like right there, right, and it's thick like this. So it, it, it I don't know, you feel like you're in a coffin or something. <laughs> Terrible. So, and, well, I don't know. Some people, are, I, I'm, I'm, I don't like tight spaces, spaces like that. So um, when I go for an MRI, you know, a few times that I've had to go for an MRI, maybe three times or so, uh, I just tell the the the, um, the person there, you know, uh, the tech, you know, okay, hold on, hold on, let me. So I close my eyes, and then they put me in, and I don't open my eyes until he tells me you're out of this thing. <laughs> One time I decided to open it, and I I told him get me out of here. And then I said, no, okay, well, you're not gonna do it. I said, no, 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 hold on, yes, I will, but you know, just hold on. So I, then I said, I gotta keep my eyes closed. And then, okay, put me in there. Why did you need but an MRI? But then I don't open them. Why did you need an MRI? I had an MRI for my knee and they just, I was like outside of a thing and it was just a big loop. That's not so bad. I've had, I've had um, meniscus tear on both knees from remember. playing soccer over so many years. Um, so I got meniscus tear in this one, the left one, and then I had to get an MRI for that. And then uh, another one for this one. The two years later, I, had, I needed an arthroscopic surgery for this one. Um, but yeah, that time when it was like that, I needed an MRI. Uh, for your shoulder. <laughs> my shoulder. Not good. No. So, um, but anyway, superconducting materials. I'll just tell you this as you pick up your stuff. Uh, the theory behind superconductivity is an amazing theory. Uh, this, was, this phenomenon of superconductivity was discovered in 1911, but it wasn't explained until 1940 something by uh, three physicists, uh, Bardeen, Cooper and Schrieffer. So it's called the BCS theory of superconductivity. And these people were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1957 or something like that. Uh, there's a street in Irvine by, um, by the airport. You know, you got Michelson. You got Teller, uh, you got Tesla, I think. Uh, one of those streets is Bardeen, after Bardeen. An American physicist, I think he was from Michigan, Wisconsin, thereabouts. So he won the Nobel Prize in physics for his theory of superconductivity. And uh, many people were working on this theory, but this guy succeeded because he was very, very I mean, it was something that people wouldn't have imagined. What's involved in the theory of superconductivity are electrons in the material that end up attracting one another. I mean, who would have thought of that? I mean, electrons hate each other, they're negatively charged. But through the interactions with the what are called lattice phonons, vibrations in the, in the lattice material, they can end up attracting one another and forming what are called Cooper pairs. So Cooper you know, contributed to that and then these guys did the rest. So, Bardeen won the Nobel Prize in Physics with these two other people for the theory of conductivity. Bardeen also is one of the inventors of the transistor, and he won the Nobel Prize for that. Bardeen, John Bardeen is the only person who has won the Nobel Prize in Physics twice. The only person. I mean, Einstein deserved at least four Nobel Prizes, but they only gave him one. John Bardeen got two. And it's interesting because he got one for theoretical work, and he got another one for experimental work. Because he invented the transistor with two other people when he was working at Bell Labs in New Jersey. Uh, and so, you know, because of that invention, now we have cell phones and Zoom meetings and, you know, computers and so on, just, you know, because of that invention of transistors. Uh, 
So the only person who has won the Nobel Prize in physics twice is John Bertini. I mean, there are people who won more than one Nobel Prize, like Marie Curie. Uh, she was from Poland, and she won the Nobel Prize in physics once, and she also won the Nobel Prize in chemistry, but not both in physics. Uh, so it's the only person, American physicist. John Bardeen. Hasta la vista. Have a good spring break.